Hello, this is Ralph K. Genorio welcoming you to the 16th uh, video adaptation of my lessons on the historical background to the September 11th, 2001 attacks. What we've done so far is we've covered the history of monotheism in the Jewish and Islamic contexts up to the foundation year of Israel in 1947. But we've left the Jewish people stuck being kicked out of their homelands in the year 135 by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Today's video, uh, this video, begins uh, the story of the Jews' experience during their great diaspora, which is <laughs> not called great for no reason. From the year 135, when the Emperor Hadrian kicked them out after the Bar Kokhba revolt, until 1947, two years after World War II, the Jews were forced to live as what the Cossacks would have called Inogorodin, uh, people from other towns, as strangers in a strange land, as Robert Heinlein would uh, put. For 1,812 years, the Jewish people did not have a homeland and so they were scattered like grains of sand lifted in your hand on the beach on a windy day and tossed up into the air they scattered wide and far but where they scattered they were not able to to change the imagery from sand to seed take deep roots and there were a variety of reasons for this First off, some basic terms. Semite refers to a person of Jewish or Hebrew or Israeli ethnicity. So anti-Semitism is simply an irrational hatred of the Jews. Anti-Semitism takes many forms, overt and covert, and has been with us since at least uh, Moses' time. As the Jews have been a distinct ethnic group, with a core belief system that is utterly uncompromising in its fidelity to the Godhead. Well, as the saying goes, to be an individual is to be indecent. By being so strongly themselves, they could not help but provoke reaction. And sometimes the reaction of people to strong personality on an individual level is dislike and antipathy, and this is true for groups as well. So anti-Semitism is an irrational hatred of the Jews. The other term, and this comes from the Middle Ages, is usury. And what usury means is the loaning of money at interest, which is what banks do all the time. If you use your credit card, you're not simply expected to pay the money that you borrow back, you're expected to pay the money that you borrow back with interest. If I were to borrow $1,000, from a bank or on my credit card, at the very least, during the term of repayment, I would end up paying back the bank anywhere from $1,100 to as much as $1,500 or $1,600. And if it's a credit card, it could be even more, depending upon how long it takes. That's interest. And that interest is what makes people go into banking or money lending in the first place. If you're going to loan money, you should make money. That's the point. Um, but in the Middle Ages, usury, the loaning of money at interest, was considered to be profoundly sinful by the Western Christian, what later became the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't until the 13 and 1400s that church attitudes began to change, and as the Medici bankers became Medici popes, and as the Fuggers began funding things in Northern Europe, the Fuggers are bankers from Northern Europe, um, the attitude uh, and uh, religious uh, law and proscriptions against usury began to change. But throughout the thousand years of the Middle Ages, from the fall of Western Roman Empire to the fall of Constantinople and the discovery of America, usury for the most part was something that was considered sinful and therefore few Christians openly partook in it. This is going to matter when we tell the story of the Jews in the Diaspora. The great philosopher, or the great historian, of the Holocaust, Raoul Hilberg, in his Destruction of the European Jews, 
Posited anti-Semitism in, pro in profound forms taking three different forms. The fir these three forms can be summarized as statements. The first of these statements is, you may not live as one of us. In other words, you can be here, and your family could have been here, for hundreds of years. Your family could have been in this city long before my family ever showed up. But I'm a German, I'm a Belgian, I'm a Dutchman, I'm an Englishman, you're a Jew. You were a Jew, you will be a Jew. Your ancestors were Jews, your children were, are going to be Jews. We are natives, you're not. Now I live in Maine. There's a benign form of this, and I, I, I don't mean to trivialize anything, but just, just to get the idea to click. My wife grew up in Maine from the time she was in fourth grade. Her mother's, mother's family was from Maine. They had been here for generations since Maine was a colony of Massachusetts. But because my wife Tina wasn't born in Maine herself and hasn't lived here her entire life, she will never be a Mainer. Take that uh, silly local nativism and extend it into the realms of real pathos and race hatred and you get some notion of you may not live as one of us. Now, in the movie and in the play Fiddler on the Roof, uh, Tevye is, said, is to say at the beginning that living as one of us is uh, as dangerous as, as being a fiddler on the roof. And then the fiddler goes into the opening music and uh, there's a wonderful story that unfolds, wonderful and terrible at the same time. But the story of the Jews in the shtetl, the rural Jewish, Jewish ghettos in the Jewish Pale in southwestern Russia and the Ukraine and white Russia, there is a universality to them. As strangers in a strange land, Jews had a special challenge. And the challenge was to live reasonably functional lives amongst the natives that they had settled with, while at the same time preserving their essential Jewishness. Now, by analogy, I'll explain this from American history and Christian history. During uh, the time before the English Civil War, there was deep religious division within England. There were Catholics who were hated by all forms of Protestants and Reformed Christians. And there were, there were Anglicans, members of the Church of England in the United States today called the Episcopalian Church, who followed fairly Catholic ritual but uh, in, a, in a church polity or political structure that was headed by the King of England. And there were the Puritans, and the Puritans were Reformed Christians, Calvinists, uh, of what would now be called uh, Presbyterian or Congregationalist belief, and they thought that the Church of England was way too Catholic, and they were not happy. They wanted to clear, clarify, and purify the Church, but royal power was on the side of the establishment Anglican Church. So many Puritans who had the get-up-and-go and the wherewithal to get up and go, got up and went to a friendly country across the English Channel called Holland. In Holland, the Dutch Reformed uh, Christians welcomed English Reformed Christians as brother Reformed Christians. But soon, the English children of the, ref uh, of the Puritan families began coming home wearing wooden shoes and speaking Dutch. They were growing up in Holland most natural thing in the world is for children to pick up the language and customs of the dominant society. So the Puritan families who thought of themselves as English as well as Reformed Christians decided that they would leave Holland and go into the gaping, yawning wilderness of North America. So we have the story of the arrival of the Pilgrim Fathers at Plymouth Rock and the settlement of Puritan England in, Pil uh, uh, in general terms. They did not want their children to grow up Dutch. They did not want to be absorbed into the body politic and the society of Holland. They wanted to remain distinctly English. Well, for a Jewish person of the diaspora, that challenge to remain Jewish was even stronger. So, you keep the dietary laws. 
you keep the laws of dress. In Fiddler on the Roof, they talk about the, uh, the special uh, dress that the Jews wear to remind them of God and to remind them to pray. And there's the forelock that orth Orthodox Jewish men wear and the long beard also, because if God had wanted men to be clean shaven, he wouldn't have given us beards. But by remaining Jewish, by retaining their distinct dress, their distinct customs, their distinct holidays, by being clannish and keeping to themselves so that they can mutually reinforce their Jewishness, by intermarrying almost exclusively with one another, they provoked offense among the native population. I'm not justifying anti-Semitism, but I am explaining it rationally. If you're a native and you are in these times and you have a son who falls in love with a Jewish girl, it's extraordinarily unlikely that that son is going to be allowed to marry that Jewish girl. And if, she, if he is allowed, it will be only after a series of remarkably difficult obstacles that have to be overcome. And in so many words, the most natural response in the world to something like this is, what, my son's not good enough for your daughter? How dare you? You don't even act like you're from here. You keep yourself separate. You keep yourself apart. Here's the thing. Modern Americans have sort of prissy uh, hygienic habits. We bathe and shower very frequently. I'm one. I like being clean. But in traditional European society, people did not bathe very often. The facilities simply weren't there. So one's natural body odor, odor was part of one's presentation. The way you dressed, the way you spoke, and the way you smelled were all apparent to the people around you. And by keeping kosher, by maintaining a separate and distinct set of dietary codes, Jewish people altered their body chemistry enough so that their B.O. smelled slightly different from the body odor of the people around them who ate pork and the other things in native diet. Now, smell is a powerful thing. Smell is the one sense that most easily bypasses your rational conscious mind and reaches into your id and your subconscious. And, 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 and controls your emotional responses to things. Think about when you smell nice, fresh, homemade apple pie. It can bring you back to when you were a little kid. So by looking different, by keeping to themselves, by behaving distinctly, because they needed to, to retain their Jewishness, by eating different foods, at every step of the way they tended to alienate the people around them. And this alienation of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish Europeans amongst whom they, whom they lived, was exacerbated by the most natural and nasty human emotion, envy. In the United States, in the year of our Lord, 2013, most prejudices are considered to be obscene, but one. You're not allowed, and thank goodness you're not allowed, to openly judge people on the basis of race, creed, background, or even sexual orientation. But God help you, if you're rich, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You don't know what it's like to work for a living. You didn't really earn that. The President of the United States, Mr. Obama, you didn't earn that. You didn't make that. Envy, class hatred, a desire to blame your life's shortcomings on those who seem to have it better than you is something that is encouraged by certain factions within the United States today. Class hatred and hatred of the rich plays into anti-Semitism because of usury. In the Middle Ages, if people needed to borrow money, they went to Jewish bankers because Jewish bankers could engage in usury without being punished by the church authorities. So there is the hatred for the outsider combined with the hatred of the man whose ring you have to kiss in order to borrow money. People do not naturally kiss the hand that feeds them. We often bite it. And on top of it, 
In Jewish society, there is an absolute encouragement and insistence on educating yourself and bettering yourself generation by generation. So not only were Jews distinct from the civilian population, native population around them, not only did they tend to have more wealth, they tended to be more educated than the people around them. They did this for the best of reasons, but it provoked the nasty race hatred, clan hatred, and religious hatred that is anti-Semitism. You may have been here, your family may have been here for a thousand years. You are still a Jew. You will never be French. You will never be Dutch. You will never be German or English. You are a Jew, and your people will always be Jewish. You may not live as one of us. Next time, second phase, anti-Semitism.